what a wonderful world. Welcome to See and Learn on SABO 2014. In this second report, we'll be looking at the activities that took place over the last two weeks of October. The visiting experts have been busy doing presentations, field trips, and school visits. However, Urban Winter was doing even more than that. Serena went to find out what he's been up to. Well, we, we see that uh, sharks are in, uh, in decline throughout uh, the Caribbean. And in order to uh, protect sharks, you have to get insight in, uh, in their behavior because you, um, you need to know um, where they spend their time. And if it's on a very local, small area, then you're uh, then putting a sanctuary or a no-take zone. It's much more effective than if they wander around and uh, hop from island to island. Um, and then you need other directed uh, measures to, uh, to protect such a population. So you need to know the underlying movement patterns and able to, to save uh, or protect uh, populations. And lo a lot of this uh, basic uh, knowledge is, um, yeah, is, is not out there. Uh, we know uh, from most species we know very, very little, especially in this corner of the world. So what we try to do now is uh, fill up these uh, knowledge gaps and um, uh, yeah, get to know more of the basic uh, biology and the movement patterns of individual uh, sharks. So tagging is your expertise, is that why you've been out with the fishermen all week? Well at first um, we deployed the detection stations, uh, eight in total, uh, around the island and uh, on the pinnacles. And what we, these detection stations, they are um, yeah, listening stations. Uh, we attach them on uh, mooring lines from buoys or we place them with a block and a pop-up line and a float adjacent uh, to the moorings. We, we put them in uh, the deep ones with scuba diving and the shallow ones um, with uh, free diving, Yella from uh, SCF is a very good free diver and that saved us a lot of time. Uh, so the next step after uh, placing the receivers is to uh, get sharks around with, uh, with transmitters in them. So we cooperated with local fishermen and we used different methods to catch them, uh, rod and line and short long lines. We were able to get uh, six uh, Caribbean reef sharks uh, in the first two days. Yeah, we uh, bring them alongside the boat, then uh, with a rope we secure their tail and then we uh, lift them from two sides uh, on board. Uh, we flip them over and uh, the sharks they have uh, yeah, this unique feature that once you flip them over and they're lying on their back with belly up, they uh, get into a certain trance uh, state that's called tonic uh, immobility. And that allows us to work with these animals. And, um, and then I make a, a small incision in the body cavity of a few centimeters. And we put the transmitter in the body cavity of the shark. And then I stitch them up with a few stitches. And then uh, we measure uh, the shark uh, total length. And uh, it's been set free again to uh, collect data for us. The transmitters that we uh, implant in, uh, in the sharks, uh, they last for um, for about four and a half years. So that gives us uh, the opportunity to follow individuals for a, long, um, uh, for a long period of time. The batteries in the receivers, they last about uh, one to one and a half years. So we have to uh, renew uh, the batteries uh, every year or so to, uh, to have a functioning um, uh, detection uh, array uh, around. Why specifically did you choose reef and nurse sharks to study? Well, there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is that from uh, uh, observations uh, from, uh, from scuba divers uh, and uh, drop cameras showed that, uh, that these two species are the, the most abundant species uh, around uh, Seba. Um, and uh, from other studies, uh, from the few other studies that have been around on movement patterns of uh, sharks, these two uh, have a fair high chance of uh, performing um, uh, yeah, only local uh, movements. Uh, so that, that's why we addressed uh, these, uh, these two species. Why did you choose Seba for the location to do your research? Well, Seba is um, a very uh, nice, but also a very small island, and that makes it very um, uh, logistically uh, relatively easy to cover a large part of the reefs uh, surrounding it. Um, it is also known that, uh, that uh, yeah, there's a healthy shark population uh, around Seba, so we had a good chance of uh, catching sufficient sharks for this uh, study. And, uh, and it's surrounded by relatively deep water, so um, uh, yeah, my guess would be that um, chances of finding local uh, movements and that they really uh, stick to the island um, are relatively large. Uh, so that, um, 
Uh, we want to learn a lot from the methods we uh, we use here, but also we uh, I think we have a good chance that around Seba we uh, we collect a lot of data with um, the relatively few sharks that we uh, that we uh, attack. October is the time of the year when we begin to see the migration of humpback whales through Sabin waters. Expert Caitlin Monlin explained to Serena how underwater noise might be affecting this migration. So Caitlin, you've been diving a few times now here on Sabre, but there's no whales, so what exactly have you been looking for? So on most of the field trips, we've been going on the dive boats, throwing hydrophones or underwater microphones overboard, and those underwater microphones are recording all the sounds that are made in the waters near Seba. Now that's important because it turns out that all those sounds are sounds another humpback whale would not be interested in if you have a humpback whale trying to talk from one to another or communicate from one to another. And so we consider all of that noise, whether it's boat traffic or just the waves crashing against rocks or the snapping shrimp, all to be background noise at this point. So right now we're just trying to get a good sense of the background noise that's here in Seba. So basically you're researching sound and how is that relevant to whales? Well, when you've been running dive trips, particularly last winter or a few winters ago, and starting to see more and more humpback whales show up in Sabin waters, what we understand is that we're not only seeing a lot of tail lobbing, which creates sound under the water, but also starting to see um, individual singers, whales that are hanging in the water column producing beautiful, complex, long sounds. When whales do that, they're generally advertising to other whales. Um, it's only male humpbacks that sing, and we don't know why, but it's only other male humpbacks that are attracted to those sounds. Those sounds can be heard in very, very quiet oceans, sometimes as much as half a hemisphere away. So basically, your whales that you're seeing here in Seba are trying to use those sounds to attract other males into the area in order to perform some sort of social function. Um, it's very important, therefore, that those sounds reach other males that are in the area. Recently, the status of the Sabre Bank changed, and do you think that's a positive impact on the whales? Oh, that's a really great question, and it's very interesting because Sabre Bank is built a little bit like an amphitheater. So if you have one or two young humpback males breaking off from the larger population, maybe they're unable to compete on Silver Bank, which is a larger habitat area at the moment, because the North Atlantic humpback whale population is expanding and expanding rapidly. So those younger males, instead Instead of being pushed to the edges, perhaps are exploring new areas like the Sabin Bank in order to sing. And Sabin Bank would be really attractive to those animals, mostly because it's built a lot like an amphitheater. If you take a look at it, the shallow portions have a nice curve and then they continue to grade down to deeper water. In addition, the angle of that entire amphitheater is set towards Silver Bank. So Theoretically, a humpback male singing on the top of Sabin Bank might have a great acoustic shield, per se, to kind of funnel that sound right towards the population that it's hoping to gain more social partners from. That means, though, that any kind of noise coming into this area, shipping noise in particular, which tends to be very loud and tends to overlap in frequency with humpback whale song, may interrupt the whale's ability to communicate long distances. So now that the International Maritime Organization in 2012 made the Sabin Bank an area to be avoided, that means ships do have to route around the banks. By routing around the banks, the banks themselves should be much quieter. There should be a lot less noise pollution there, and that means it's much more likely that you'll continue to see humpback males not only trying out the Sabin Banks, but maybe more and more recruiting and using that area as a singing platform as the entire population starts to expand. Our next expert, Fadila Ali, has been working in Bonaire for the last few years on the lionfish invasion problem. Before I sat down with Fadila to discuss her studies, I caught up with her at the Seba Comprehensive School, where she was showing the students how to dissect a lionfish to better understand its amazing ability to thrive in our Caribbean waters. Um, so I mostly study lionfish and their ecology really in Bonaire, where it's really looking at the size of the fish, how it's growing over time, how their weight has changed over time. And the main part of my study has been their feeding ecology, because this is how you can tell the impact 
based on what they eat. So is it more ecologically important grazers or cleaner fish? Is it commercially important snappers, groupers? And also how does this change in over time and also how it's different between the different islands. So how does this relate to Seba? So in Bonaire, we're able, we've, we've been doing a lot of baseline work and trying to understand what, what about lionfish like, where do they live, what do they eat and that sort of stuff. And that can be applied to Seba in that we know in Bonaire, lionfish are really feeding on uh, bicolor damsels and chromis and whatever. So we can see how is that similar or are they, so based on their feeding ecology, you can tell the impact of what it might be in Seba. We also know, we've already established how lionfish grow. We know that the males be a little bit bigger than the females. So here in Seba, we, we already have that information so that we can try and now personalize this for Seba and see are the lionfish in Seba as big as in Bonaire? And also we know in a five year time span in Bonaire, they've gotten to this size. So if we're seeing lionfish of 30 centimeters, it might be here for about two or three years. So we can use that information from Bonaire and try and see where Seba fits in in this invasion timeline. So from your knowledge of lionfish on Seba, what can you say about the invasion specifically here? I've done a little bit of diving and we do, we do see lionfish about. Um, they're of similar size to Bonaire. We have, I haven't seen any huge 40 plus centimeter lionfish, which might be that res a result of lionfish were longer in Bonaire, so they've been there for almost four and a half, five years, whereas in Seba it's just been a, a couple years. So we don't expect to see large lionfish, but other than that, they seem to be behaving the same way. Um, but the other thing is we can only dive so far, so we can only go down to 30, 40 meters, right. whereas there's a lot of Seba that's yet to be um, discovered because it's so deep. So over in Seba Bank, they could very well be a lot of lionfish there but we're not necessarily diving there and just because we don't see a lionfish where we dive doesn't mean there's not a problem. And what strategies have been effective in managing lionfish? Diving has been the most effective way because when you go out to dive you're going specifically for lionfish. Trapping has also been used as a method and this is this could be faster for Sabre because you also have Sabre Bank where it's quite deep and also you'll have the problem of sharks because hunting lionfish with there being such a healthy shark population here in Sabre don't really go very well together. But so for Sabre, it might be better to look at traps as a better way for removing lionfish because um, especially in areas where, there, where you have like a big sandy area, lionfish will go into a trap even if it isn't baited just because they like the structure or the place to hide. So lionfish have been found in traps, but the main sort of limitation is that it won't just be lionfish you're catching. So that's a little thing that you might need to work on to try and make it lionfish specific so that you don't end up catching other fish that you might not necessarily want to catch. How effective are these control techniques? Bonnet has been one of the best examples of lionfish management based on the strategy they use. So in Bonnet, they were prepared for lionfish. So lionfish first really came about in about 2004. So, but in Bonnet, they weren't there till late 2009. So um, in Bonnet, they had about five years and they knew lionfish would be coming. So before lionfish actually arrived, they, in April of 2009, they were training of the divers, um, there are lots of posters given around so everyone were aware of what lionfish are, what they look like, and how do we remove them. So from the time the very first lionfish had been confirmed, um, Bonaire was well equipped to go out and start removing lionfish. If we compare this to Curacao, Curacao had lionfish at the exact same time, late October 2009, but it took them about two years before they started having any major control. And just in a simple comparison between Bonaire and Curacao, the lionfish in Curacao are a lot bigger and a lot higher density compared to Bonaire. Because in Bonaire, it's easier to, con if you start right away, it's easier to control a couple fish than it is to try and go out and control thousands of fish. And how the, the need, there is need for it to be a cooperative effort, because no matter how well you control your island, 
an island upstream is still going to be supplying eggs. So to control line fish here in the Caribbean, we need to have the sort of cooperation and all islands need to continuously be removing lionfish. We've realized that lionfish are probably here to stay, but if you think of it like weeding, if you continuously weed, it's always better than if you only weed once a year. So it's a cooperative effort and it needs to be done continuously and you need to be prepared. Often hard to spot underwater due to their camouflage, but a delight when you do, squids and octopuses are some of the more fascinating creatures under the sea. Serena met with cephalopod expert Stephanie Bush to learn more about them. Stephanie, you've been on a couple of dives around here now. Did you see any squid or octopuses? Um, unfortunately, in the dives that I've done so far, I haven't seen any squid, but I did see one octopus on a dive yesterday. Um, and it was the common octopus and it was down hiding on the rocks, changing colors, doing its thing. So it was really cool. Well, I've been on Sabre a couple of weeks now and I've been on quite a few dives. I've seen squid around. What kind of species would you say they are? Yeah, so the, the one that you're going to see either snorkeling or diving here in Sabre is the Caribbean reef squid. And it's actually pretty unique for uh, among squids. It hangs out on coral reefs close to shore and um, actually they have some really cool behaviors compared to other types of squid where they'll hang out in a line, all, you know, they'll be all lined up next to each other and on the ends will be sort of sentinels and what it is, it's they're kind of have a group mentality where they're looking out from every angle for predators and so it's easier for multiple individuals to spot a predator coming from any angle than one individual. Um, but also come mating season they have some really interesting body patterning so um, as you know the squid can change color of their skin really rapidly um, but what they do is they can actually show one color pattern on one side of the body to say a female that they want to mate with and one color pattern to a male that they want to say back off you know and this is my female so they can actually show two different things at the same time um, which doesn't happen in very many squid that we know of. In your research you study deep sea squid would you expect to see them in the deep waters around Sabre? Uh, yeah, actually, definitely. Um, unfortunately, they're too deep for you to be able to see um, scuba diving or snorkeling. But because Saba, um, the land drops off so quickly underwater, we get into really deep water, actually not that far offshore here. And there's certainly uh, lots of different deep sea squids and octopuses that you could see if you, say, had a submersible here that you could go down to those depths. Like all the other experts, you also went to the schools and you did a small project with them. How did that go? Um, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, some of the kids have actually seen squids or octopuses while they've been out snorkeling, um, but some of the other kids hadn't had an opportunity to see squid and to see how they're similar to us and that they have very complex eyes that can see just as well as our eyes, actually. Um, but then obviously they're very different from us because they live underwater. They um, breathe oxygen from the water instead of from the air and, and move di very differently than we do. So it was cool that we could just cut them open and you know they could see the gills, they could see the ink sac, they could dissect the lenses out of the eyes of the squid. Um, and every, we all had a lot of fun doing that. Seba has a few unique species which are only found on our tiny five square mile island. Biologist Bob Powell explained to Serena how we could keep it that way. So Bob, you've traveled around a lot of the Antilles and how do you feel that Seba's environment has been altered compared to the other islands? Actually Seba is a gem. Um, all the islands have been impacted to varying degrees by people and the plants and animals that they bring with them. But Saba has managed to accommodate some of those changes and yet maintain a lot of its natural character. And that's unusual. Only a few of the other islands can boast of anything close to what's been achieved here. But that's unfortunately threatened. Um, when you look at the dynamics in the Northeastern Caribbean, uh, St. Martin, which is the main supply line to Saba, is also the major center of commerce in the region. And almost everything that travels into and out of the area goes through St. Martin. And St. Martin has been dramatically altered, uh, in part by um, 
introduce plants and animals, some of them intentional, some of them accidental, um, but also by the very fact that so much of it's been developed and it's altered the natural system and made it accommodating to these invaders. And because of the proximity and the degree of trade, um, Saba probably isn't quite as vulnerable because of its unique topography and the types of habitats that exist here and the fact that it's not liable to be as developed as intensely as, as St. Martin, still has a lot to lose. And two of the huge threats uh, affect animals with which I'm interested. I work mainly with amphibians and reptiles, and uh, one of those threats is actually not an amphibian or a reptile, but a mammal, and that's the mongoose, which was historically introduced into many West Indian islands uh, to control rats in the sugarcane fields. Um, it didn't work. Rats are active at night, mongooses by day. Mongooses ate lizards and snakes instead. And on many of the islands with mongooses, those species are either no longer there or they're very, very restricted in their distribution. If mongooses got onto Saba, we would lose the snake that's unique to the island. Uh, it would have a damaging effect on the iguanas and other impacts that we can't even anticipate. And so every effort really needs to be made to keep them out of the Sabin ecosystems. Uh, the other threats are animals with which I work, um, one being the iguanas. Um, the Sabin iguana is special in that it's been here for a long, long time, long before humans. And because of its isolation on Saba, it is unique and may very well be deserving of status as a species all of its own. Whereas the iguanas on St. Martin are all introduced and their source is unknown. They may have originated in Florida where they're also introduced, Central America, South America. We really don't have any idea. And if they were to get onto Saba and start interbreeding with the Saban iguanas, and they're closely enough related that that's possible, they would literally dilute the gene pool that's here and Saba would no longer have a unique animal found nowhere else in the world. Um, the other is the Cuban tree frog, um, which is native to Cuba and to the Bahamas, but has been introduced widely, primarily as a hitchhiker on ornamental plants. And they're widely distributed on St. Martin. They're super abundant. You can't hardly go anywhere on St. Martin without finding them. And um, if they were brought into Saba, we don't have any idea what they might do here. Um, they would certainly eat the local frogs. Uh, they might eat some of the lizards. They'll eat basically anything they can get in their mouths. And the impact on invertebrates, insects, um, that probably haven't been sufficiently monitored here or anywhere else, we might be losing species to them without even knowing it. And there are records of St. Martin iguanas having gotten to Saba. There are records of Cuban tree frogs having made the voyage. And so far, we don't think that they've been established or had any long-term impact, but we have to stay vigilant. And more effort needs to go into examining the types of things that are brought in, be it in containers or in any other venue, even personal luggage, people bringing a pet back, for example. And uh, because of that threat, um, one of the things we have to do is create more of an awareness. And the best way to do that is to engage in educational programs at all ages. Um, we often think that it's all about adults, but it really isn't. The future is with the kids. And that's what's so great about the See and Learn program. It's not just that we come in and speak to an audience primarily of adults, but we also go out and work with the kids. And um, in this case, when we took the kids out, uh, one of the animals we caught was a snake, which they enjoyed. You're not scared of that? No, we're not scared of the snake. We talked a little bit about the fact that the snakes are here. Uh, we talked a little bit about snakes and what they do. And we tried to create an awareness that the snakes weren't a threat to them and actually a part of the natural system. And if they grow up with that kind of attitude, then when they're making decisions, they're going to make good decisions more often than not. It's been a pleasure to be a part of See and Learn on SEBA 2014. And to conclude this report, I would like to add on to what Bob Powell and many other visiting experts have said over the years. Education and awareness is an important part of what See and Learn does, not only for the adults, but more importantly, for the school kids. What, what does the light look like? What color is the light in the water? White. 
All of the experts that attend See and Learn visit the SEBA schools to show and explain to the children all about their field of expertise. This opens up a whole new world of interest to the students. I remember when I was 14 years old and I encountered my first see and learn expert at the Seba Comprehensive School, who specialized in bromeliads. She taught us how to dissect them and we learned so much about the ecosystem within it. See and learn has influenced me to pursue a career in biology and I could not be any more thankful for that. So once again, I would like to say a big thanks to all the sponsors that help make See and Learn happen. From the volunteers who help out, to those who offer food and accommodation to our visiting experts, and onto the larger benefactors that donate the much needed funds, without which See and Learn would not be able to take place. We hope that you enjoyed the events of 2014, and the See and Learn team look forward to seeing you all next year for a lot more local environmental awareness.